to talk about something that I really like doing, which is researching dolphins in Virginia. When I told my uncle years ago that I found the source of our family, that it was Virginia, he said, no, it's not, that you were from Kentucky. I said, well, how'd they get to Kentucky? I finally found that out, answer two. I also want to thank Karen. She's been a field trooper with me because I've had several things going on and they've been very patient. David for all his technical skills. And he's going to help me today because I don't have to worry about these slides he's going to do for me. And then I have some researchers that I want to mention because this is not a lone white project. This is by far one of, of a huge proportion of people who over the years have donated a lot of material to the Dolphin Newsletter. Which is, if it hasn't answered questions, it certainly has inspired questions to me. And these researchers are the ones that I probably contact sometimes the most about the family group A that you all know. Uh, Jim Klump is top of the list, and he is my fellow researcher. He's, uh, he's also from Group A, and uh, he's very well trained in doing research, and he's taught me a good uh, deal of information about how to do that. Well, Norman Davis covers, I think, I think he's in the genetic G family, but because he's got the name of Davis, you've never seen him on the charts because he's not carrying the dolphin name, but he comes from that group. Uh, Archie Dolphin comes from the Greater County, Tennessee group. Um, we have Mary Beth and Garland here, and Mary Beth is a very fine researcher. She does a lot of teaching of genealogy. Steve Harris is the other one, and my little, there's a, just a little group, I call us the Craig Harris and Plump group. We sound like the lawyer group, but we're not. Steve is the indigenous dolphin researcher in Pennsylvania County. Robert E. Dolphin lives in California, I wish he could have been here. And he comes from uh, the Granger County area, but not quite from what we call the Granger County group. And finally, Tracy Walker, who is published He's a published person on Samuel Dalton of Mayo, which makes no sense to all of you wonderful British people who are here. But Samuel Dalton settled on the Mayo River, and uh, he got, I somehow he got that name, and we all to refer to him that way. So to begin, what I want to tell you about is that uh, I gave this a lot of thought, and uh, I think I'm going to add something to get, gaining the stories back here. Gaining the stories of our ancestors and putting them down on paper and sharing them with John in the journal. Um, and that is that we concentrate on relationships. And I think that they're the second hand to this business about stories. Relationships, if you think about it, um, are the very focus of what a family group sheet is. And they're also the focus of what a family tree is. And finally, they're the requirement of lineage societies. You wouldn't join a lineage society without the link that's called relationship. So they're, they're just integral to what we do in our families, in our health families, and in genealogy. So I want to prove relationships, as I'm sure all of you do. And the question is, what do we do when we don't have the proof in the records that we need. There's nothing that says John is the son of George. Well, we have to get secondary evidence, and I think preaching to the choir here. But that's really difficult in this country in the 18th and part of the 19th century. Records on birth and death and marriage were not mandated until about the beginning of the First World War and then they didn't even have to take effect until about 1920. So we're scot-free in the 20th century and now the 21st century, but before that, it's not as erratic as you could ever imagine. So we have to use a lot of secondary evidence. There's no way around it, unless you have one of those good families, and oftentimes they're German families, that just keep writing down all the relationships in the family. <laughs> we got it. So to get this evidence that we want to try to prove some sort of relationship among these Virginia Dolphins that are in the group, we're going to take geography. 
and we're going to take paper records that aren't private records. In other words, they're not birth certificates and records. And we're going to look at migrations. And we'll see if these elements will tell us, are they all sons of different men? Are they brothers to each other? Or are they something else? In Albemarle County, we can change that. Um, there are three groups who were there in the 18th century. One, group one, I'm going to call Timothy X's group, or Timothy Senior. And I'm using X because that was his mark that he signed documents consistently. Never changes. Then we have the Merriweather Daltons. They like they get their land within the Merriweather family, which is a very well-known family in Virginia. And they hobnob with the Merriweathers as well as with the Jefferson family. And they brush elbows with a lot of public officials. Then the third group is invisible Daltons, and that's not a demeaning term. They really don't show up in Albemarle. But they, I'll tell you later why we say they belong to Albemarle. And they are, by the way, group G in our genetic families in the Dalton Genealogical Society. <coughs> so, for group one and two, now, they're, they're either related or they're not. So, we're going to look at things that we'll ask and try to answer the question what's the relationship of Timothy Sr. with? all the other Daltons that are in Albemarle County that belong to family group A. The question is there because Timothy is extraordinarily silent. He doesn't tell us a thing about himself, hardly. And he doesn't even live quite in the perfect, quite in the perfect spot that we could say he is definitely related to the Daltons. So we will look at him as a separate group. Next, we need the map to show you what I'm talking about all the time, because I'll keep referring to these counties here. Timothy, Timothy X comes in in 1726, and he signs, or he witnesses, a power of attorney that Lewis Griffin is making to his son. I think his son's name is Richard Griffin. And, um, we stop and say, you know, anytime you come across a Griffin, well, what does this mean? Is Timothy related to Mr. Griffin? Um, is, um, is he just a good friend of Mr. Griffin? Or is there no relationship at all? Because a lot of times at these courthouses, if you were breathing and standing next to somebody, they grabbed you and made you a witness to one of the documents. So we really don't know. But he comes in to hand over you can see here on the map. And right now, in 1726, what you have is Spotsylvania County above it and Carolina County next to it. And everything else to the west of that. Now, we're not even to the Blue Ridge Mountains, for you Americans that know about the Blue Ridge Mountains, um, is divided into huge portions of land. And so they're not very well settled. Because if they were well settled, there'd be a courthouse there because the government's going to get their money. And the way this goes, and we're still on this slide, is that in 1720, Spotsylvania County is formed, so it's there when Timothy gets there. Caroline is the same, or Hanover is the same time. Uh, Gooch Land, which is down here below, you can almost see the empty Gooch Land, it's formed in 1728. Orange County, which is a striped county right above Spotsylvania and Hanover, is formed in 1734. And you don't even see Louisa County. I'll let you be surprised about that. It's not the big surprise. But it's formed from Hanover in 1742. And then Albemarle, which is a, really the county we're talking about, doesn't come along until 1744. That's a big distance of 24 years. That's huge. And in the thought of records, when we're talking about records. But Hanover becomes the first resident of these Daltons because Timothy comes in 1726. And we don't know how he comes. He could have come from the York County, uh, or the York River. He could have come. This is the uh, York River here. Oh, I'm right. Uh, he could have come from the James River here, because there's James City. Or he could have come from the Rappahannock. Um, or he could have come from Maryland. Louis Griffith happened to be from Maryland. 
we just don't know. So see, we have all these tiny nodes in our poor genealogy. Um, but he came to the courthouse, and it, this one is the colonial courthouse. Now, it wasn't built in 1726. Oh, how I should have been. It was built in 1735, so all the rest of the family who used it, it looked like this. This is what it was. And um, we have very few records from Canada because they were burned in the Civil War. They, there was a, an archivist at the North Carolina State Archives who said, well, deserves them right. Any state that would put their records right next to their magazine deserves them. <laughs> 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 And what we're really missing from Hanover are deeds and wills and marriages. What more could you want if you were looking for So we are working with very sparse records. Well, Timothy comes in. And now, this is Louisa County. And all of this part was um, in Louisa County at one time. And it, uh, it included these points that I've got up here. The Southwest Mountains that runs up. The top line would be in the orange county. And you see today's roofs, the roads that are there, because if you ever want to look at a map, that's what's going to be your, your cornerstone for looking and seeing. The meat chunk is where Timothy Subtle has bought patent land there. And there is another meat chunk down here, and um, someday I'd like to know why, but I don't know why today. <laughs> And then this little yellow line that runs across between Route 22 and Route 20 is called the Turkey Sag Gap Route. And it is a colonial route. And uh, Timothy Sr. was on this side and all the other people were on that side of the Southwest Mountains. And I'm sure they used that route all the time. In fact, the Meachuck looks like this. There's the Meachuck River at the top. And then you have the land around the Meachuck really beautiful plain. And as I said, we don't have much on Timothy. Between 1732 and 1747, we literally have nothing. We don't know what he's doing. But in 1747, his land is precession. He's not in the records. I think he's a very old man. Um, that's my only way of understanding why he's not. But he's on the precession list, and that's the first thing we've heard from him since he bought the pack. Then in 1750, he sold his land, turned around, and he bought another piece of land that was over the mountains, which takes him to find them close to all those other dolphins. And I have stood my ground so hard over the years that I could not prove that Timothy could even possibly be related. And I am relenting today. <laughs> I really think we found something that will work. So he buys some other land over there. Then in 1755, he writes his will, and um, that and another, when he sells his first land, his wife's name appears in the records, and she was Elizabeth. She is again identified in his will, and the only child in his will is the one that we all say from. It's William, and we really don't know who William is, except that I, I assume by the laws of Virginia, that this is his primogenitor son, because in that day and time, they had to leave their land to their primogenitor son. Now, this presents a really interesting problem that has not been resolved. And that is, is that if Timothy Senior is the father of all of these Albemarle daughters, then the oldest son is William. And William probably doesn't date back to much more than the 17th. And everybody who comes from Samuel's name always puts his birthday now as born in 1699. I won't go into all the detail of that, but there's actually no proof. And so this may be a real problem for us if, if we don't resolve one of these days, we will. Well, we're going to go next to the group two, which is our very wealthy group. And it starts with Timothy Jr. And the next you no, know, it starts with Samuel Senior. I, I put the elder there first, Samuel Senior, and then uh, Timothy Junior, who always signs his records with a T. 
even when he migrates away, he's still using that tea. And Robert and John. And this is the same group that is heading the family group A in our white DNA uh, group. So their profiles, again, I'll just reiterate for you to remind you since I'm, I'm so familiar with these, I'm not sure that I've made it very clear. They're hobnobbing with the gentry, the landed gentry that's there. Um, John is sort of the exception, but that's only because he comes very late. The records right before they leave. Samuel and Timothy have money to buy land. A lot of people came over to this country as indentured servants, and they didn't have money to buy land. So that tells us something. What it is, I'm not sure, but it does tell us that they at least are in an upper economic level than what the majority of the people are in Virginia. Robert married well. He never had much land. I don't know why, but I think he was a teacher because uh, when someone dies later on, they say that that, they, that his, uh, he's owed from their estate the teaching and the boarding of their children. So I'm pretty sure he's a teacher all those lives. But he married them. He married Mary Key, and she was the daughter of John Key, and they lived uh, very close in the group that we're talking about. John is very identifiable, too, because he had two blind children. And the daughter, one's a son and one's a daughter, the son is named Sam and the daughter's name Mary, and she shows up in records in Albemarle County, and then those two children show up again down in Pennsylvania County when they migrate down there. Hidden here, that you will never see so far in Albemarle records, is a David, and he's named David Senior eventually, and his, um, his fame, claim to fame, is that he's always in debt. <laughs> And there, besides Timothy Jr., who's always pulling them out of debt, there is Timothy Jr.'s neighbor, Benjamin Hensley. So these are the ways that I have to identify these people. Not really very clear, is it? But after I have worked with it for about 15 years, like I have, you begin to remember those, those things. Uh, next slide shows their land, where it was, there in Louisa and Albemarle County. There is Pretty's Creek, which runs down into the North Fork of the Rivanna River, which then runs down into the Rivanna River. And the two other little squigglies off of Pretty's Creek and off of the North Rivanna are uh, a couple more landmarks that are used by Samuel and by uh, John in their deeds. We'll find that in a minute. And if you can see a very gray, small, gray mark this side of the Southwest Mountains. That was Timothy Senior's land. And then the next, next slide gives you back here, but a very clear picture of what all of these little waterways were. In our colonial period in this country, everybody slept on a waterway. And once that was gone, they tried to get as close to a waterway as they could. Pretty Creek is where Timothy Junior was. Plus, he was also, he had some land that was down here on the Wolf Pratt Ranch, I think. Turkey Run is where Timothy Sr. bought his second bit of land, so now you can see how he's coming into this group. And Samuel is on Wolf Pratt Ranch, and the John that was there at the very end of their living in this part of the country uh, was also on Wolf Pratt Ranch. And I put Flanagan's Creek in there, or Ranch in there, because the Keys, uh, Robert and Mary Key Dolph and Mary end of the Flanagan family, and there's only one Flanagan family. So this was also very close to them. Okay. Timothy T. His land looked pretty much like this. What happened was to um, Jim Plump and I went to Albemarle County with the help of Tracy Walker. Uh, we tried to find out where we thought the land would be. I'm not sure. But it's all the land is this beautiful. So if you look at this land, you're, you're seeing something that certainly is similar. And Timothy had, he had two patents that he bought in 1738, turned around and sold them in 1745, and left. Uh, and I was explaining to David that I think I know why he left. There was some land offered, 
and had tax moratorium on it, and he saw the opportunity to make some money. So, at the time, uh, when, let's see, I'm going to go back to Robert, and that's why I've got this, because Robert, no, you can go you know, straight. Robert, who married Mary Key, inherited uh, 200 acres of land, and it's sitting somewhere down here, a little to the left. That's another picture of Timothy's land. And if you go to the next one, we'll, we'll look at Robert's. There's Robert's uh, land. It's down a little farther around the Rivana River, so it's almost as though they came down the pretty uh, creek, and I don't know that that's the case, but it's a possibility. And later on, the John that I mentioned bought 100 acres on Wolf Trap Range. Well, what are these implied relationships with the Mary Brother Rawlings? First of all, their land clustered around Pretty Street, except that early land was in They all had the same uh, economic status that makes them basically uh, even with one another. And besides Samuel, uh, who had a son, William, and it's not the same William that Timothy seen. Uh, and his daughter married the county warrior, which is pretty good. And then they were also chosen a lot of times to be the surveyors and the, the layer off of roads in that area. All of that status stuff in Virginia. And the Virginians know this. <laughs> uh, so their social status not included other people whose names are really important to you, but Thomas Walker may be because he was the man who had the Virginia um, grant on about all oh, land hundreds of thousands of acres beyond the Blue Ridge Mountains. It never came to much, but he had that great uh, And Samuel and Walton bought in with some shares to it. Then there are migrations. We've looked at what their land tells us, and we've sort of heard what the records are saying. Their migrations were that they all migrated south, just what we call South Side Virginia. It's Pennsylvania County, eventually it's Henry County, uh, Patrick and Carroll County, and when we see some of these Y-DNA marks on the chart, we actually see some of those Carroll families dividing off from that one mobile group that's so big. The relationship between Timothy X and the Mary Brothers, we've been through. And since he was a silent member, um, we're going to, that's fine, we're going to uh, leave it at that. But we have to know that his migrations didn't happen, so he's not part of this group. He died in 1767. And this group really didn't migrate totally until around 16, or 1770. And um, if old William was his son, then we know we have a line from Timothy in the group, but we haven't proven that yet. There is an old William, and it comes from the tax record. Timothy, or not Timothy, but Samuel's son William, stayed in Alabama County and became known as Captain Lee because he had a unit in the Revolutionary War. And that's always on the tax, tax records. It's amazing what the tax man really did for us. <laughs> we don't think of it even today, but they gave labels to these people. And the labels were significant and they were consistent. And um, so, Old William was Timothy's son or somebody else's son. We don't have any proof of which way he went. But Samuel's son was Captain William, and he was always younger. And I do want to mention that, same way with the junior and senior, I don't know what happened in England, and maybe it was the same thing. But in this country, in the colonial period, senior did not mean that he was the father of the junior. It meant that he was the older of the two. And so that title alone did not prove that Timothy was a father. Timothy Senior was a father of Timothy Junior. The third group in Albemarle County are these invisible dolphins. The head of the group is David Senior. And then you can see the names of the son. Now, if we are tempted, and sometimes we are in genealogy, to use names to link people together and create great relationships, here's the best example isn't going to work because they're not related in any way 
by DNA to the alpha viral coming elements, but they're there. The reason we know that they're there is that um, everybody but David Jr. fought in the Revolutionary War. And during the Revolutionary War, this family moved to North Carolina. They settled in the Rutherford County area. They were a little bit broader in the counties that they chose, but they were all there, except for Bradley. And they got pensions for the Re Revolutionary War service. And each one of them started out with, I was born in Albemarle County, Virginia. The only thing I've been able to extract that would help us is that William, the oldest one who served the entire war, that's a lot of service, uh, said that they lived in Charlottesville. Well, Charlottesville was not in the Pitties Creek area. It was south of there. Not a, a terribly amount, of miles away, but still, no one in the Albemarle County group of the, the ones that we are having in our family group today ever lived in Charlottesville. So they were really distinctive family. And Bradley and David Jr. stay around when Dad and his three boys head for uh, North Carolina, although William did stay around too for a while, served in Virginia and he served in North Carolina. That was very unusual for someone to serve in two different states like that. Bradley and David Jr. had their eye on the couple girls, the Robinson girls. And they got married after the war, or even during the war, 1777. And eventually David Jr. went down to Rutherford County, uh, North Carolina. But Bradley went west. He went to the area that became West Virginia eventually uh, during the Civil War. We can prove the relationships in that family without any problems at all because of those, those Revolutionary War pensions. They're, they're Daltons of very modest means. They're not quite the same economic level. And ultimately, uh, we, we don't know what their origins are any more than what we know about the marriage group. So it's been fun. <laughs> Now, because the homeland for all of these dogs was originally Hanover County and became Louisa County, I want to look at Louisa County for just a minute. Here is the map once these counties are all formed. And you can see that Louisa County is taken from the western half of Hanover County. Um, today, Louisa County is a farming community, probably always will be. They, it has a, a courthouse that is not tall, not like our head of the county. Courthouse is on the right, of course, and the old jail is on the left, and those all date back to about 1868, and I think the courthouse was built in 1870. There are two Dalton families there. Yeah, next one. And this, by the way, is what it looks like in the farming area of Louisa County. One is John and Mary, and she's Mary Branham, and the other one is Robert and Mary, and she's Mary Saunders. And there's no hint of relationship between the two of them. They have the same distinction that we found in Albemarle County. We have a different economic level, but we have a different social level. And a little bit of difference in the geography, but not a whole lot. John served in the French and Indian that took place between 1759, no, well, actually he served 1759. It started in 1754 and went to 1762, I think, and, or 1763. But he served, and we know that because I think that there was a real concern about who was going to win the war when the war first started, the revolution. And so an awful lot of men went to the courthouse who had not claimed the valley land from Britain <laughs> and put in the claim for the bounty land. And that's what John did, or we wouldn't have known that he was the John that is on the French and Indian War records. But the strange thing about it is, you saw where Louisa County was. He wasn't from the same church parish. He was actually from the parish 
alternative terrace that was in the eastern part of that Louisiana. And Robert was from the western part of that community. So they started out quite different ones to the other, and also in the time frame. He did move to Fredericksville Parish when he married Mary Grant Johnson. And they started a family, and he's listed on the tax records, and they can follow him. But we have so few records that we're really not sure yet what, what this family unit is like. We know we have John and Mary, and we know a couple of their children, but it's nothing that we can claim. We also don't know their relationship to the Alma Mama County group. But since he came from the east, I'm beginning to wonder if that's telling us something that we've never known before. His, um, his land is on the um, one of these creeks that actually is a branch of the Harris Creek, I think, called Gibby's Creek. And eventually, and when Robert comes in eventually, and Robert is born in 1768, but he doesn't move to Louisa County until the 1800s, early 1800s. He lives to be an ancient man, he lives into his 90s. Um, he lives farther north, and we can see an area there around the northern part, around Hickory and Goldmine Creek and that area, and we'll show you a church. That was called Forest Hill Baptist Church, and it's where the Gibson Mill community actually formed this church, and that's their little cemetery. And um, that's probably the group that John was in. Robert, on the other hand, uh, was probably the son of Captain William. I should not have proof of that, but he's about the only person he could be the son of. And by association, he's in Louisa County, where there's another marriage there by the family that descends from uh, Samuel. He has property and slaves. That sets his economic level. So Samuel over now in Wild County, Samuel is the only one that usually has slaves in the Dalton family. Nothing to be proud of, but it does indicate that there is an economic level there. And friends the same way, Wayne Dexter is in all of those hogs and the gooches that, that uh, pepper that upper echelon of Apple Wild County. So next, uh, I'll show you a couple nice little landmarks there if you've ever been to that area. And by the way, you go down 33 and you get to Mineral, Virginia, where the earthquake right, took place last month. <laughs> just so you know that we don't have more than just three families going on. <laughs> um, the uh, church up there is probably right down here. Uh, I didn't take this long. And there is an intersection here called uh, Boswell's Tavern. It goes back to the period of time the Dolphins were there. And this is a house in the area of pavilions. And what is important about pavilions is the fact that Robert died in 1855. And his wife Mary lived on and watched the Battle of Pavilions in the Civil War. It must have been pretty terrible. She had two sons in the war, and she had two sons that were not in the war. And they also had two daughters. They were all daughters and children of Vietnam Robert. So, with all Louisa Kelly, let's go with one more. We close our book today on the Dolphins of Albemarle County because it really was a parent county that was very important. In this small area of Virginia, Hanover, Louisa, and Albemarle, there is this pocket of Dolphins who began some of the families that we all we just said. And in the collection of secondary evidence, such as geography and records and migrations of Jews, will help to expand our knowledge of their lives, and we continue to hope our understanding of their relationships. What we need is to listen to their whispers. Perhaps they're telling us to work, and then they'll be more than <laughs> this is some other land of sand that we lost. That's up around Mug Mountain Creek, which is in the northwestern section of Albemarle County. Uh, this is probably down around Wolfpack Branch. 
This is, uh, again, in Hanover, across from that beautiful courthouse is this wonderful old inn, which how and I've eaten at. It's wonderful. And this is Greenbrier. This is a church in Greenbrier County, West Virginia today, and it's churchyard. And there was one of the folks that we were working on there. We constantly go to the courthouse. Well, thank you. Thank you.